Okay, hi everybody. This is um, the Plein Air Painters first critique of the 2021 season. We're honored to have um, Clayton Beck III with us as our expert teacher and plein air um, instructor. He's an instructor at Palette and Chisel, Watercolor is Supreme. Um, and so he's gonna give us a lot of good information, I'm sure. So take it away, Clayton. Well, plein air painting, uh, <laughs> it brings its own problems, especially in Chicago. Uh, this particular one I've seen uh, many times out painting. Uh, you have crowds that come around, comments. For this one, I would say that the biggest problem is uh, choosing a spot where a lot of people will be passing by can be a bit unnerving. Uh, if you're used to it, uh, that's great. But if you're not, it can be very um, difficult to concentrate. What was the, Barbara, are you, are, am, are you on audio? Okay. Uh, when you were doing your lighting, uh, obviously in plain air, things go in and out. Uh, was this a cloudy day? Was this a sunny day? This was a sunny day. Okay. Uh, so I'm seeing I some on, shadows on, cast. Okay. Yeah, I was on the cloudy side for the most part. Okay. Uh, I'm finding it a little bit difficult to figure out what the light of the day was. Okay. Uh, I see cast shadows from the people, but then from the fence and from the umbrellas and things like that, I'm not. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the, the temperature of the shadows that I'm getting underneath uh, the overpass, bit in conflict with some of the cast shadows that are happening on the sidewalk. Uh, do you have an uh, idea, a clear idea what the I, temperature of the day is before you begin, or are you painting and following things as they change? Um, when you say it like that, probably not. I don't think I thought about the temperature right from the get start. I was thinking about the crowds and hoping that I could make that the focal point, uh, you know, in the distant count. But in terms of the temperature, wasn't uh, probably not in my head at that time. Okay. One of the most important things about landscape painting is immediately setting what the temperature of the day is going to be like. Uh, because it will be shifting a bit, especially when you have buildings knocking the light around like crazy and changing angles. Uh, you have some bright colors. So the first thing you want to do when you set down is decide what the temperature is going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, try and have an idea of what the uh, weatherman said and what you hope is going to happen on that day and kind of figure out a point to work toward. If you're working uh, on a complicated drawing, and this had quite a bit of complicated drawing in it, that can be very distracting. So you might want to separate drawing from painting. This is why a lot of the um, painting techniques do that. They separate the drawing and the painting that you're not uh, getting uh, distracted by color. Usually it's some kind of a monochrome wash or just line work. How did you start this one out? I did try to start to block in the, uh, the left side <clears throat> without the highlights and it was, and then the underpass. So I was thinking about at least that when I started. Okay. Um, again, drawing is, a, is an essential part of any cityscape because you're constantly dealing with perspective. Uh, that perspective uh, was actually done quite well here. I could see that a lot of things were related. It's very easy to uh, figure out. Can you see, um, let's see, can you see my cursor yes. moving around? Yes, I can uh, see 
it's it's a very easy thing to say that perhaps this line isn't following uh, the exact perspective or this and this and this are all following a slightly different perspective. These are relatively minor things, uh, but they are things that you you want to be aware of. I could see that you got the general movement here, the general movement here, big things moving down this way. So I feel that uh, people are getting smaller properly with the perspective. And that can take up quite a bit of time when you're landscape painting. If it is an overcast day, uh, then you have a little bit more time. But if the sun is constantly moving and changing the shadows so drastically, uh, it can be very difficult uh, to concentrate and get the drawing right and then work on the temperature. This is why I say have it in mind ahead of time. That way, once you begin painting, no matter what, you're going to follow that temperature that you're planning on. So you're not always going to be painting exactly what you're seeing. Occasionally, you're going to have to alter things because the sunlight will be dropping in and out and changing the temperature. Okay. Okay. Okay, I see. Thank you. All right. That's great. Is Cynthia with us? All right. I'm uh, seeing, uh, a, again, a, a very strong uh, perspective. A little bit better drawing would help this one uh, a bit. A lot of times I just simply hold up my, my brush handle instead of trying to figure out a perspective because not everything in Chicago was built on a, on a perfect grid. A lot of things uh, are are built at slight angles, which makes it look like your drawing is off. If you follow what's there um, I, with your brush handle, instead of looking for uh, a Carlson's guide type of, of uh, perspective, you'll have a much better look to it. I think that I can see the struggle with these arches going off into perspective. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to get uh, curves than to feel like they're moving in perspective. In general, I really like the value range you've worked in. Light lights, dark darks, but the overall is kept in the midtones, which makes it read very nicely. The only thing that I'm uh, having a little trouble with is how dark this is. I realize that the photograph has uh, has what they call plugged up where there's no color in there but being out there i'm pretty sure that your eye would have seen uh, a bit more okay deborah page watercolor oh, from life this is the way i like to work watercolor from life uh, it's exciting uh, you are always dancing on that edge of overworking and then trying to get the drawing right with watercolor, a lot of the problem comes with textures. How do you deal with the textures of things in a landscape? Because they're so varied. We're dealing with wood. We're dealing with uh, some kind of pavement. We're dealing with sculpture, uh, grasses, trees, and sky. Uh, so many of these things have to be thought out with oil, we have all kinds of thicknesses and transparencies and opacities to play with. Whereas with watercolor, we have the paper and a transparent watercolor uh, film to, to work with. So sometimes uh, learning from other people's um, work is excellent. This is why I like work looking at uh, Anders Zorn and, uh, and uh, John Singer Sargent's watercolors, because they were so inventive with the way they put the watercolor down on paper. And it always seems to be a bit of a controlled uh, uh, accident, <laughs> um, for want of a better word. Uh, because you're constantly waiting for one area to dry to a particular point so you can continue working in there. And yet 
you're needing to concentrate on the next area. So you're never quite getting that sitting back to think about it that you get with pastel or with oil. I, I love working with watercolor out there. By the time I'm finished, I'm just exhausted though. <laughs> Okay, so this was the reference photo, and we can see uh, how much we're dealing with architecture, uh, sculpture, concrete, grass, sky, trees, rocks, uh, there's, and there's even water. Um, so there's all kinds of things to deal with, uh, with watercolor. Some of the rules that I learned in Mr. Krajewski's class, uh, hold true to this day. And a lot of times, if you simply work from background to foreground, you'll have a tendency to get your edges to start to work right. Uh, this is one of the things with, uh, with watercolor that a lot of people miss out on is just a simple technique of dealing with uh, uh, all the complexity that's out there. Obviously, you're dealing with your lightest lights first and then moving on to your darks. So squinting helps to organize these light areas and to move into the darks. Is Deborah Popley here? I am. Wonderful. Okay. Let me get your... I didn't no, send a reference. No reference. That's fine. No. That's fine. I never take a reference, so I never have one. Whenever I'm, <laughs> whenever I'm showing my landscape work, there's never uh, any photographs to go along because I don't have a camera with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is one of the things that scares me when I see landscape painters out there and they're constantly pulling a camera out. Uh, the, the joy of going out landscape painting without that feeling that I always have a backup uh, and that I'm always going to be able to finish it later. Um, I think of uh, plein air painting as the experience itself and the painting is the record of the experience. So when I look at something like this, I, I'm seeing your thought out on the paper. Uh, pastel is a wonderful medium to go outside with very few do. I'm so glad that you did. Uh, how big is your set? I actually have um, 300, <laughs> but okay. I, didn't, I didn't bring that with me. I only brought um, about 25 oh, or 30. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, my, the, one of the last times I went out, um, landscape painting uh, in pastel. I don't do it very much. Last time that I did, I um, did Buckingham Fountain. This was about 35 years ago. And I had my 525 stick set out there. Whoa. <laughs> so, it's insane. I, yeah. You were much smarter to limit yourself to a full range of values and a full range of colors that you can work with because pastels are so dependent on the pressure that you put on them to get other values. So if you, right now you have, the paper that yep. you worked on was what color? It was a, um, it's a, it's a, a tan, uh, a dark tan. Okay, so is it showing through and oh is it showing through down here down at the yes. bottom? Okay. Yeah, you, okay. you can see it on the sidewalk. All right. And you can see it somewhat in the sides of the buildings. Okay. One of the great things about pastel is learning that touch. Uh, if you look at Antonio Mancini's uh, pastel paintings, you'll see that he's only used about 15 to 20 sticks, but he gets so much out of it because of the touch. The paper is carefully chosen for value and for color. And then each of the sticks is then used in conjunction with the, the paper. So if you're dealing with a, a very dark paper, then all of your light sticks are going to have many values in them. Uh, if you're working with a, a lighter paper, your darks will have many values to work with. And if you work with a mid-tone paper, which is about what you look like you've worked with here, you get the advantages of 
having your lights have have several values, having your darks have several values, and then allowing that mid-tone of the paper to be representing quite a bit. Uh, are you, you also using a, a spray fix? I haven't done this yet, but I did, um, I, you know, Nancy um, uh, King Mertz, or Mertz King, um, she, I used, she, she uh, showed me the technique where you set the darks and then you take um, uh, alcohol and you mm -hmm. uh, wipe it. So I did that, which, which I think is an interesting technique because it does set the, it, it, it adds depth because mm -hmm. it makes the paper a little darker uh, in a lot of areas. Yeah. So yeah. that's the technique that I used here. Okay. I, the, the, I'm looking at the color scheme. I'm seeing that this was a full sunlight day. Is that correct? Yeah. I was on the sunny side. Okay. Of this. Oh. It's coming straight over the right shoulder. Okay, I'm seeing a diagonal shadow here across the, the sign. Is mm -hmm. this where uh, the sunlight was and then down here, or is this sign actually diagonally divided? Oh, no, that was sun. That was okay. meant to be. That was meant so, to represent sun. Okay, so what I'm getting is that there's shadow here and light here, but not here. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. I, so I'm not sure if this sign is at the same distance as this or if this is in front of it. Got it. Mm -hmm. I, I see what you're saying. If that shadow line were continuing through, then I could see that this and this were on the same plane. If mm -hmm. not the way it is now, it looked the sign is well in front of it. So this could have been helped by edges. See, right now, I have mm -hmm. a very sharp edge here. I have a very lost edge here, which pulls this a bit forward and pushes mm -hmm. this a bit back. So this is where a little bit of confusion is happening because of the edges. Mm -hmm. Pastel is a wonderful opportunity for edges without getting your fingers in it. That's whenever you get your fingers in the pastel, that's the last um, I, I, thing before insanity sets in in trying to get the edge right and i highly recommend you try getting through whole pastels without touching the pastel itself mm -hmm. uh, if you do you'll then be forced to think about the texture of the paper the softness or hardness of the stick you're using the pressure and the speed that you're pulling those strokes at because all of those things affect the edge that the pastel leaves. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah. Your choice of color for the sky. <laughs> talk talk yeah. to me about that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know why I chose that. I just, it just felt, it was just a feeling thing. And I know it's a little, it's a little ominous. A little bit because of the value. That's why I bring it up. Uh, mm -hmm. This value and this feel lighter than this. And the time when that happens, uh, when things like this are very light and then the sky is dark, it has that ominous feeling because it feels like a storm is coming. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. wanted that, that was rather effective. <laughs> if right, right. So lightening that up, you think will help the help this absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. and then you could begin to work those edges back and forth as you bring the branches into the light because as the branches get smaller and the light then has that feeling of wrapping around those branches the edges get softer and the values get closer together between the two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right very nice okay well thank you all right yeah, I haven't put fixative on it yet, so I can make changes. I would, uh, if you're working on a paper that holds the pastel very well, I would consider not putting any on there at all, because if fixative affects pastels differently. The dark changes a little bit, the very, very dark darks change a little lighter and grayer. The mid-tones uh, 
in the reds especially begin to lose some of their color. Um, mm. It doesn't seem to affect the yellows as much, but the very light lights get darker. So yeah. trying to anticipate all of those things as you're working uh, so that when you spray it, it looks correct. Um, I learned to just bang my pastel on the ground and whatever falls off falls off already and then once it's behind glass you're safe so consider not spraying at all if it's the way you want it and if you've used a paper that has a lot of tooth that holds the pastel well okay thank you all right all right i know deborah's here hi here i am <laughs> thank Wonderful. you for doing this sure this is fun I'm not in a panic at all. <laughs> all right. Um, perspective. Now, I, I mentioned it before about uh, having things, um, uh, just holding up your brush and trusting it sometimes. Uh, if you try to figure out every bit of perspective, especially when you're dealing with arches, holding up your brush handle extend it out and then moving that angle over to your painting a lot of times will help you fix things so many times when we're looking at things we know they're vertical or we know they're horizontal and that affects the way we paint them instead of painting the perspective of the point of view that we're seeing as I look at this window in the upper left it looks like we're looking straight into the window and then as I come down and look at the arch, you've gotten a good feeling of the depth and thickness of the arch. I'm feeling like the building is leaning over a little. I'm not, not sure if this is the way it was photographed or if the way it was painted. Uh, it could have been the way that the, you cr cropped the photograph that uh, it feels like this yellow building here is leaning a bit. Mm. I, uh, as you are looking, you've excellent feeling of sunlight. As I look at the edges all along here, that's exactly what I see when I'm out in full sunlight and I'm seeing something projecting and uh, a shadow flying through the air and then landing on something. The difference between what's in the sun in the shadow is very well observed. I love the fact that you got this to get the feeling that this is the thickness of the building dropping back and not the face, but I'm having a little difficulty finding that across here. I would probably bet that this had a little bit more difference than what you've painted here. If not, I would have considered making it that way because right now I'm feeling the, the turn of the building here and all the way across here, I'm not quite sure. I'm not seeing your pointer. Is that what you're using? A yeah, I, I, I wish I could make it larger. Right now it's turned into a small crosshair. Okay. Uh, can you, can you see it in the sky? Yes, yay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I'm seeing okay. the building turning. Mm -hmm. And then as I come down uh, the side of the building, I can't quite tell what the face is from the side. And this is right. one of those things, I can tell that the direction the sun is coming, it's almost evenly lit from the side to the front. Mm -hmm. So it was going to be very close in value. I would have considered in that situation, altering them a bit, to show the face from this so that I got the feeling that there was space between these two buildings. Because right now it feels like this face runs right up against the edge of this. Yeah. And let me take a look at your reference one more time. Now, did you take your reference from the same point of view that you painted from? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so it's it's you can see that the camera because of the wide angle lens is really picked up on the fact that this is sloping down and I'm not getting that of sloping down happening here. Okay, so 
I uh, consider looking at your reference uh, uh, when you get back and looking at your subject, your painting, and seeing what you could have done differently as far as drawing. Mm -hmm. This is one of the advantages of photography that uh, I think gets missed in um, in landscape painting is that it can be used, check the drawing. And it's an excellent reference for that because it draws faster than we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just make sure that you understand the different lenses that you're this is a wide angle lens here. So what you might want to do is take your photograph and crop out uh, the to to about the perspective that you uh, had painted. And then when I have this next to this, let me make this smaller again. When I have these near each other, now I can see that the perspective would have been helped by uh, studying the, the photograph afterward. Don't try to do it while you're out there, though. I see a lot of people looking at the back of a camera while they're painting. Uh, trust your eyes, and you will train yourself to see these things a little better. All right. Great. Thank you. Hi, Howard. <laughs> We've got your correct painting up here now. Um, Howard, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everybody, if you don't mind, uh, a little bit of um, uh, the uh, correcting that you can do with your photograph. Um, would that be all right, Howard? Hi. Hi, Howard. Uh, do you mind if I, I Please do, do a little experiment here? Okay. Uh, there's a thing in, in Photoshop. It's also in other programs called levels. You might have heard of them. Uh, one of the things that you can do with levels is color correcting. Most people think it's a value adjustment, but if you understand that you can pull in your levels and it'll correct your color at the same time, uh, oftentimes we can't see a color cast that happens on our work. So I'm gonna pull up the levels uh, dialog box here. And at the top, it says RGB, red, green, blue. Means that that means that all the channels are mixed together. That's the way we're seeing your image right now. If I use the drop down box and I just go to the I just go to the red channel and I look at this hump here in the middle. This is the distribution of values of red in your picture, and you can see that there's practically nothing here. Nothing here and, and here. So what you do is you take the, the sliders and you bring them in until you start until you start to climb that mountain. And you do it with each of the channels separately. I'm not even looking at the painting. I'm just looking I'm just looking at the different channels. And as I pull this in, as I pull the last one in like this, look at the color. This is the color corrected through levels. And you even have a little preview box here. That's what it looked like before. And this is what it looks like now, which I think is probably a little closer to what you painted. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is called pulling in your levels, and this is the most important thing you're going to learn today. <laughs> I know we're talking about landscape painting, but when you're presenting images, uh, the first thing that you want to do to your reference photographs or photographs that you're uh, taking of your work is to go to levels and then go to the individual channels and then pull the sliders in from the outside until start un, until you start to get some real information in there. 
By doing that, you're going to take all color cast off of your work and you're going to get a much better image. If I then go back to RGB, you can see now that hump is, is kind of looking like a comb and that's because the values have now been distributed a bit. And if you feel that your work is a little too light, you can move this slider to darken the whole thing in all of the colors at once so that the color stays correct. And conversely, you move the middle slider to light. It was fine right in the middle, so I'm going to return it to that. I think this is probably pretty close to what you have. So we're going to take a look at this. All right, and then you would just resave it. I think you've chosen a wonderful subject. This is something I would have sat down and painted in a heart. It looks like a forest, except it's architecture. And it's a wonderful opportunity to play those reds and greens against each other. Uh, so many times that simple idea of the opposites on a, on a color wheel to work with can get you started. Mixed in with all these grays, these reds and greens just really give a, such a beautiful harmony. Uh, very fresh handling, Nothing worked over uh, more than, uh, you know, two or three strokes. Uh, this is the way that I like to work in watercolor, very fresh. Uh, in fact, the, I just posted a watercolor that I found of mine that uh, I did 40 years ago. And the handling of paint is very similar to this. I, how much time did you spend on this, Howard? Uh, 90 minutes, maybe. That's a good amount of time for a watercolor. Uh, after, after that, I usually have to let it set to let the watercolor settle into the paper. And then you get the opportunity to play on top with uh, some details. And if you're playing, obviously, if you're playing on top, they're going to be darker details. I can see. I can see that you went in with a few of these darker strokes over an already almost completely dried area. Excellent technique to work with in watercolor. Thank you. Very fresh. Thank you, Jill. How are you doing today? I'm great, Clayton. Thanks. Uh, All right. Now I'm just taking a look at these two. I'm going to blow up. I'm going to enlarge your painting in a minute. Um, okay. I just wanted to get a, a good feel for, for what you were looking for. All right. Let's make this a little bigger. There we go. Um, did I make that too big? Yes, I did. Fit screen. There we go. Um, the one thing that I saw in your reference that that's missing a little bit here is a strong sense of pattern. When you are thinking of things in shadow, they should belong to one part of the value scale and everything in the light should belong to a different part of the value scale when you're working with uh, strong sunlight. So that means everything that you're looking at in shadow should have uh, a feeling that it belongs together. When I looked at your reference, I saw that the shadows all joined together and the lights seem to punch through in bits. When I'm looking at uh, your painting, I'm seeing that you were looking at the individual areas 
and thinking about that area instead of thinking of diametrically opposed areas of light and shadow. Uh, does that seem fair? Yeah, absolutely. I thought I had a lot of darks in there until now I see it, I don't. <laughs> With watercolor, that's a problem. I, I, you have to set your darkest point so a little differently from the way that somebody in pastel or oil might, because once you start going that dark with watercolor, it starts to get very heavy feeling. I usually like to keep my uh, values pulled a little away from the lightest light I, of the paper and the darkest dark I could possibly paint. That way I'm always dealing with something that I could adjust a little bit. Okay, I, I see that when you looked at the shadow, I don't know if you could see my, my cursor here on Oh, my yeah. cursor on the side. This dark here, mm -hmm. I'm seeing that this person standing back here in the middle is also about the same value. I'm not sure if that person and that person standing up here in silhouette and the shadow under here were really that similar. I this is the kind of thing that you have to constantly ask yourself when you're out there is what am I looking at? Instead of, um, in terms of paint, where does it belong on the value scale? If you're squinting down and you can't see something, something clearly, then don't paint it clearly. Our natural urge to understand things is open up our eyes to understand things. It's worked in every other aspect of your life. You open up your eyes and you stare and you understand what's there. When you're painting, you're dealing with values and edges and things like that. These are things where you really have to trust what you see when you're squinting down. And if you can't see something clearly, figure out how to paint it in an unclear way that matches how you're seeing it in relation to everything else. Does that make sense? It does. And I actually thought about that, especially that figure on the tracks. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I have a photograph of the figure standing there and it's like super clear and super dark. It's like a silhouette. <laughs> and then I woke up the other day thinking, no, that's in the distance. That shouldn't be that dark. <laughs> And things in the distance have a tendency to move toward middle tone, meaning the lights get a little bit darker, the darks get a little bit lighter. It, and what happens when values get closer together, that's when edges start getting softer. So mm -hmm. people talk about edges getting soft as they go back. It's not because they get fuzzy. It's because the value structure. the value structure is getting closer together and simpler. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Joanne Hardling. When you're sending in a reference, I, I would definitely have made sure to have cropped uh, the sidewalk out. I realize how difficult it is to photograph things, but even that now just looks cleaner. I'm seeing your subject rather than a painting, a canvas. So that's just a little advice, uh, relatively unsolicited, but <laughs> you're getting it. Um, when you were painting outside, uh, what made you choose this particular spot? Are you here, Joanne? When I look at this, I, I often paint in this range, meaning the darks aren't too dark, the lights aren't too light, meaning I'm staying in the middle range as much as possible. By doing that, you stay in the nicer color range. If you, if you open up your box of pastels and you, you're, you let your eyes stop on the bright... All right, I, I'm looking at... The reference down here, and 
I'm seeing a very typical landscape uh, in my area. Late winter, early spring, where you're looking for something. Uh, it, you're looking for any bit of color. You're looking for any bit of drawing uh, because it all just seems to be a mass of, of gray brown, you know, and it, it's not. When you're out there, you'll find that uh, the natural light itself brings all kinds of subtle, subtle colors in there. Uh, you rightfully chose the, the water to highlight in there because you're getting a wonderful uh, difference difference between the water and its the reflection of the sky in the water they manifest themselves in completely different ways and i love the fact that you knew it was sky and yet you didn't just grab the same stick and use it down in the water let me uh get this a Zero. There we go. Um, again, I would uh, send in slightly higher resolution images. Uh, I don't know how you're capturing these. Are people photographing these on their phones or with their tablets? I did with, with my phone, yeah. Okay. Um, there are settings uh, in your camera where you could in, in your phone, in your camera section, where you could set the, the resolution as being high, medium, or low, or with specific numbers. Uh, usually, there is something that, that just says best quality. And when you're photographing your work, you might want to at least temporarily go in and set that. So um, again, how many uh, pastels did you take out there? Oh, gosh, um, maybe like 60, maybe. Okay, that's, that's a, uh, certainly an amount that you can handle outside, not, not 525. Uh, and what paper are you working on? This was a UART 400. Okay. I, and the color of it was very light. What, was it a light value? Uh, you mean the day, the, the light no, of the, the day? No, the, the paper itself. Oh, no, it was um, tan. Okay. Um, you're, because your, your lights are popping off and your darks are popping off. So I had a feeling it might be uh, a mid-tone paper, which is the way I like to work most of the time, a mid-tone to a dark. But the darker paper tends to uh, give us those nice, rich middle tones and in for color, but then lets the lights and the darks pop off uh, uh, very nicely. Um, how long did you spend on this? This was about um, an hour and a half. Okay. That's a, that's a good amount of time out there. Was it overcast? It was... Um, it was bright, but I would say it was overcast. You know okay. what I mean? It was bright. Only this little part here was kind of tucked away a little bit darker. But it seems like with pastels, I always they always come out sort of garish. <laughs> I I just, <laughs> the colors just always seem to be really bright when I use them. Well, if you, are you choosing those 60 pastels out of a larger set? No, I just brought the whole thing. I, I, I don't work in pastel too often, uh, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to practice kind of taking everything outside to see how it would work. Oh, so. good. Brave. <laughs> <laughs> I, one of the things that you can do, uh, and this is straight from Ted Smiskevich when I was in his, when I walked in with that 525 set, I, uh, uh, he immediately came over and said, you don't need this many. And he started, you know, to, to pick up my and work on, on my paper. And I could see that he was, he was so delighted with them at the same time, trying to teach me restraint. He was going in for some of them. 
some of the most beautiful color. And I, I could see that uh, he really wanted to come over and work with that set. <laughs> it, yeah, and if, I never seem to have the color I need anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, one of the things that's very difficult for a lot of people going out landscape painting is to work in that earth tone range. Uh, and the best thing you can do is simply don't bring the colors with you. In oil or watercolor, you don't really have quite as much a choice because you're looking for, because you mix all of your colors. But with pastel, you can simply just leave the, the brighter colors at home. That's advice I'm giving out that I could never take myself. <laughs> <laughs> I so love the color in pastel. And if I wanted to come up with an earth color look to my work, it would be simply, I would go into the, I would go into the blues with yellows and things. I would use uh, the opposites to bring them down. Uh, and so that when you get up to the work, it has a, a, a real sparkle about it. And that's one of the great things about pastel is it optically mixes so well. And, that, and yet when you get up close to it, you still see the pure individual colors, unless you've taken your fingers and smeared everything. That's why I say don't put your fingers in it and try and take your... Um, take, take that frustrated need to fix an edge and figure out a way to use the combination of the paper, the hardness or softness of the pastel itself, the speed and the pressure that you pull it at, all of those things will affect the edge much better than sticking your finger in it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Hi, is Karen with us? Hello. <laughs> I, you're going to find my audio still dropping out. I'm sorry. Um, when you went out to paint, uh, did you did you do a compositional sketch ahead of time, or did you begin working directly? No, I just worked directly. <laughs> okay. Um, it, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, my teacher's constantly telling me to do thumbnail sketches. And to this day, I still don't. <laughs> I have a tendency to squint and to frame out with my fingers and decide where I'm going to put things. And that's just my way. Uh, I like to jump right in because if I do a sketch ahead of time, I feel like I've left a lot of the energy that would have gone into the final painting in the sketch itself. Uh, it sounds like I'm saying doing a sketch is a bad thing. It's not. It does help you organize your thoughts very well, uh, very quickly. Uh, if, you, if, you're, uh, if you learn how to do those thumbnail sketches, uh, because you immediately begin to see, oh, this might be an issue or that might be an issue. Uh, when you went out, what was the first thing that struck you uh, as you looked out at this scene? Um, it was the, the purple tree, the purple plum tree, whatever. Okay. I, I'm, I'm seeing the, the way the background masses uh, separate themselves out so well from the foreground masses. Uh, is this something that you saw out there or did you push it a little? Uh, no, I, I kind of pushed it. Okay. Um, I was like a block away, kind of a block away from that um, house that's kind of behind the tree. So mm -hmm. I kind of didn't want that to be a distraction and um, the trees in the distance, I kind of tried to, yeah, just make those go back. Okay. Uh, is, is this acrylic? What, what is this? Uh, yeah, it's acrylic. Okay. Um, there are different looks to each medium. Is uh, acrylic something that you uh, gravitate toward? That... Um, yeah, I have been um, for a while. And uh, I, I've been just like 
I've just started using the open ones. Um, that's what these are, the um, open acrylics. So they dry a little bit slower. Oh, I haven't um, heard of this. Yeah, it's um, Golden makes it. So oh, they okay. don't dry as fast. So it works better for outside because they used to dry almost like instantly. Yes. <laughs> when I was yeah. That was one of the frustrations. That's why I never quite took to them. Uh, I always... Uh, I, I, I wasn't, uh, one of the problems with, with a lot of people working in acrylics is they're trying to make them look like watercolors or trying to make them look like oils, uh, rather than seeing the benefits of the medium itself. And its advantages are that it doesn't look like oil when you're using it in thin washes. Uh, and it doesn't, I look like watercolor when you're using it in the thicker brush strokes. It has its own charm about it. Uh, but I think you, you did an excellent job of organizing your value structure to separate areas and yet not have them look like they're pasted on. This mass of, of tree to the left, left the yellow one, it uh, doesn't have a feeling that it's pasted on top. It feels like it's integrated into the landscape nicely. The only thing that I see this, uh, the dark green bush, it looks like the tree is kind of arching around it and doesn't want to touch. It almost looks like, you know, you don't want your carrots and peas touching there. So it's little things like that. I probably would have chosen a slightly different point of view to give that feeling of, of one thing passing in front of another. And I mentioned that because when you came up into the tree, that could have been something that you would that you would have been able to integrate the, the feeling of certain branches passing in front of others and certain sky holes having a feeling that they're behind. This is uh, uh, that constant feeling of one thing passing in front of another is something you have to deal with with every brush stroke when you're out landscape painting because it's a constant distance thing. N nothing is right next to each other. Everything has a feeling that it's... I, I got some perspective forward or back, but I really like, like the feeling of the colors that you've used because of the value range. Sorry, I have to take a little drink. I'm beginning to lose my voice. All right. And thank you very much, Karen. Hey, thank you. Kirsten with us? Okay. Um, one of the things to deal with in landscape painting in the city is going to be signs. How do you deal with lettering? <laughs> because all of our lives, we are reading things. We're meant, we're looking at signs and we read them for information information to help us uh, know where we are, know where we're going uh, uh, to find our place. And yet when we're landscape painting, that different thought pattern thought pattern of I'm reading is in one part of your brain, but all of the rest of the landscape is in a different part of your brain. It's what does it look like to me, I, especially in a visual sense. And that's why I think that uh, a lot of people have so much difficulty with the signs when it comes to um, I, how to do the lettering, because it, I can tell that a thought changed because the application of paint changed, and then uh, that part of the painting has a tendency to feel, to stand out a bit differently because it's been thought of differently. Uh, I really like the fact that the uh, figures that were brought in have a feeling of movement. 
they're not static. They're not just sticks or stylized uh, uh, shapes in the, in the cityscape. So the fact that you've studied the people as they were moving and then chose a point of view uh, that they're passing through. Another, another thing that happens when you put people in landscapes is they tend to take over and they absolutely didn't in this one. Uh, I have that beautiful awning uh, at the top, uh, this interesting handling of the sky as it meets the edges. This is the exciting stuff of this landscape, not the people. Uh, and I think you handled that really, really well. I would have thought differently about uh, the, the lettering simply because you used different edges on the lettering than you did on the surrounding areas. Try to repeat some of the paint handling that you used to get the edges the way you wanted them around for the lettering itself. Think of it as being a little less reading and a little bit more integration into the landscape and into the painting itself. Thank you, Kirsten. Hi, Lori, you with us? Yep, I'm with you, thanks. Okay, I'm going to, uh, if you don't mind, I, I'm gonna do a levels on yours and let's see what it looks like. Uh, okay, here we go. We're gonna pull up the, the levels dialog box here. I'm going is to this go to just for is this just for photographing or is this to actually change the, you know, to, when I go to paint. This is every single photograph you ever take when you take it with a, a camera or your phone or your tablet. It's wrong. It needs editing all photo all digital photography needs editing. Uh, and the, the fact that we don't think about it and gain some skill in it makes us suffer. If you're using things as references, then you're going to want to adjust them so that they're either closer to the vision that you saw out there or they're closer to the vision that you're thinking of that landscape artistically. Either way, it needs to be. I uh, uh, thought of in terms of another thing that needs to be considered is sharpening, but I'm not, I'm probably not going to get into that too much, but I do want to talk about levels because it, in because it instantly fixes color problems and value problems. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm going with each channel that was the red channel this is the green channel and i'm just pulling these in until that the mountain starts to starts to grow there now i'm on the blue channel pulling that in a bit in photoshop in. you can do this uh, in photoshop in uh, uh in gimp in lightroom in anything because levels are in just about every editing program I've ever seen. So here's the preview checkbox. When I take it off, you see what happened there? That's, that's the edit of pulling in the, the levels. And that's what it was. When I look at it now, it has a yellow cast across it and it looks a bit gray feeling. And when I do the edit, I think it's closer to what you painted. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. So I'm going to hit OK. to, And we're going to take a look at that. I did talk about sharpening. I, I, I'll talk about that just for a second. I'm not really going to um, explain it too much. In filters, there's a, 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 an area called sharpening. 
And then there, there's a, a dialog box called unsharp mask, which sounds funny, uh, unsharp to sharpen. But just now there was some sharpening done and you might've missed it. So I'm gonna turn this off. That's what it looked like before. This is what it looks like with a little bit of sharpening on it. This is again, probably a little closer to the way your uh, painting looked. So you might want to consider that. Okay. That little bit of sharpening was too much. Then it's a matter of playing around with these sliders down here. But I'm going to leave that. Uh, OK. I, now, I see that you've used uh, many different paint handling techniques. What kind of canvas are you working on? Oh, it's just a um, just you know canvas board. Okay, um, you might want to try uh, a different surface um, with exact with exactly the same techniques uh, and the same thickness, just to see what the difference is. Those canvas boards take paint in a certain way. And when you say prepare your own boards or uh, work on a, a, a smoother canvas or a rougher canvas, the exact same strokes and uh, thickness of paint can end up very different. Uh, so I would say experiment with some of that. These uh, uh, canvas boards are, are actually more difficult to paint on than some of the other surfaces you might experiment with. What I do like is uh, your range of values, your organization, because you've organized these areas nicely. I think that, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor off to the left here. Uh -huh. Yes, I can. Okay, this area here, I, I take it as a, a, an architectural element, I would, think even if it was in shadow, the sky itself would still be shining in there, raising its value and taking it out of the same value range that this deep dark shadow under the eaves is getting. So you might want to consider um, before you begin, decide what your darkest dark is going to be and what your lightest light is going to be and don't let anything interfere with those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. I love your subject matter. I probably would probably would have moved it off center. Right now, it's very centered, and I would think uh, that. Uh, let me try a slightly different a cropping. I uh, this is not. This, this is not a suggestion. This is just to see the difference. That off center now has a feeling of coming into the piece and moving toward this. And then if this had been lighter and perhaps with a, a different variety of edges, would have had a feeling of being able to move around. And this is one of the very, very difficult things to do with, uh, with landscape painting is to get that uh, movement so that it feels like you're walking around in there. With the full composition like this, I want to walk right up the center to this pagoda or whatever this is. And I just want to stay there. So it's a, I think it, there would have been a little bit more movement around the painting itself if this had been slightly, had had been more off center. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. I can see that. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Is Linda Brown with us? Yes. Hey, Clayton. How you doing? <laughs> All right. Again, I. 
I love this time of year to paint because most people don't go out to places like this to paint. They don't see the beauty of it. I'm going to do a very quick levels pull in this time. I'm not going to uh, explain it as I do it, uh, except for when you have areas off to the left like this in the red, that means there's no information there at all. And you're wasting uh, the, the, um, the ones and zeros <laughs> for it. It's actually um, quite complex what I'm doing here, but it's a very simple thing to do. And the results are very different. Okay, so that is what it looks like after. This is what it looked like when you sent it. Which one is closer to the final painting? Um, I'd say somewhere in between. Um... Okay, so... I could go back to the RGB and I can lighten this up a little bit. Okay. And how does that compare? That's a little, a little better. Yeah, definitely. A little better, maybe a little lighter. Somehow what I have is so muted, even in real life. So um, not as much as the photo, but. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm seeing a slight color cast also. It feels a little yellow. Uh, again, digital photography, every bit of it needs help. All right. I'll critique both, actually, because they both make very interesting paintings. Uh, in this version of it, we're getting the values that pro probably were pretty close to what was out there. I, I, I think that the base of this close tree probably would have shown more texture, more value range, because this one is close, so much closer to us being at the bottom of the painting. And the, all the texture that you have in the background here uh, is getting slightly pulled forward compared with the bottom of this tree, simply because not enough uh, time was spent painting that area. So when you have things in the distance, consider how they're painted differently from the things in the, in the foreground. Okay, and the other version of it, this is, this is again, a, a value range that I'd like to paint in out there. Um, it feels like that Monet, um, where you're raising the values and working into that lighter range in order to express the feeling of the light that's surrounding you. On a high overcast day, uh, uh, we often get this um, slightly muted feeling out in the grass like this, uh, especially with things in the distance. especially with things in the distance uh, that if, where the atmosphere is affecting it quite a bit. So I love to paint this subject matter. Uh, and it's, you know, I get it home and it's because I wanted to do it. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> Cause I get people ask me, why, why did you paint that? Uh, and I, I, I have to give them the, the answer because I wanted to. One of the things that you want to be very careful of right now, this is not matching because this area in here looks like sky and the reflection of this tree would have blocked any reflection from the sky. So a little bit more observation at the, where the water met this lowest, met the grass and the tree immediately behind it, that blue wouldn't have continued. And I think it would have had a, uh, a little more of a feeling of that water properly meeting the grass. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I feel like I got just a 
beginning on this and I was gonna go back and rework it and I'm not even clear where I want my focal point to be or if it needs another tree or some geese. I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions about where to take it. I would say that most of the rest of the painting can be left alone. I would concentrate just about everything on that tree on the right. Okay. I think that uh, uh, a real understanding of the feel of that hitting the ground and then the way the branches pass in front of the dark tree and in front of the light sky, you're going to find the edges completely different because the light falling on the branches in front of that dark area are going to stand out, whereas the rest of the branches in front of the sky, it's the it's the darks that are going to stand out. So you're going to find the edges around the lights are going to be different from the edges around the shed, around the, the darks and the branches. To me, that's what I would make this painting about, that tree on the right. And most of the rest of it is, is just, just fine. Just fine the way it is. Okay. Okay, it, it, um, I got messed up because I got cold. I was painting in the shade and I moved to the sun. And, and when I got home, it looked totally different than how it had looked when I was painting it. So that's helpful to um, get some ideas about where to take it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Okay, we've got uh, Ray Volchek. Is that pronounced correctly? Yes, I don't think he's. I don't think he's here. Okay, um, this I'm not sure, but it looks like either acrylic or gouache, uh, which is something I used in school. It's also called opaque watercolor. Um, I'm not sure. I think it might be acrylic, though. I think uh, it's I think it's gouache, and I think he's also using casein, maybe. Oh, that explains it. Um, uh, interesting, and I love the fact that he has integrate. He's got a sign off to the left, and yet it's completely completely integrated into this landscape. Uh, I it. There isn't any special handling uh, because of its size, its, pl its placement, and the fact that the lettering was not done with any strokes that feel very different from the way he did the pillars uh, on that second level. Uh, it seems to feel that it fits very well into that area. I'm not quite sure about how dark the sky is. Uh, I could see that, um, it, I, again, it has a little bit of that, that feeling of uh, uh, a storm coming, but the blue tells me that it's not, that it's blue sky. I, I love the fact that the, uh, the colors are all muted in just the right way, in just that way that they still are very identifiable. Yet nothing appears garish. All right. Oh, now we're up to Robin. All right. How long were you out there, Robin? Uh, well, what about three, three hours at the most? Um, Is this yours? And... I think I mixed up one of the pictures, labeling one of the pictures. Um, are these all your photographs? Um, yeah, that, yeah. I think the one on the left is kind of what I was going for, even though I took out a bunch of trees. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm seeing a completely different angle. Uh, it's, it's the photograph on the right seems to have more of the angle that you painted from. Uh, so I'm not Photo sure. Photograph on the right is Laurie's and we were standing next, yes. kind of next to each other. <laughs> okay. I labeled that. 
wrong. I was, like I said, I'm a bad typist. Apparently I spell Lori R O B I N. I, all right, let's see. When I, when I look at this, I feel that the building itself is integrated into the landscape. And obviously because it's covered by trees and bushes and things, I, uh, you did a lot of clearing because you wanted to see the building. You're telling me this is my subject matter. And your placement right in the center is telling me that this is what you want this painting to be about. Yeah, I was a little mad at myself for flopping it right in the center there. I should have done a little better sketching out. <laughs> what did you paint on? Um, it's on board, like um, just so board. I, I can tell you that uh, occasionally I have taken and just run a saw right through the side. All right. <laughs> yeah, it, it, because I, I messed up the composition. I, and that's the wonderful thing about painting on board is it's a lot easier to do it than on canvas. I, I do like the value range. I like the colors that you've chosen. I think that I, a little bit more study um, of what to do with the edges in the in this as the foreground begins to meet uh, the building. Uh, I think you have uh, had a little bit of trouble with what should I do in this area. Um, yeah, I I really all I can say is I didn't really compose it very thoughtfully. I love, I love what's going on up at the top. Uh, these trees you uh, that don't seem to uh, gather together gather together as well in your reference photo, you've organized them very nicely in the painting. At first they feel like clouds and then you realize they're trees. Uh, because they're passing in front of the, the roof and they're held up by these branches. I think a, 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 a better variety of values and edges in the branches would help these feel more like trees. Uh, and that is one of the very difficult things about going out painting in these massive trees is the layering because there are trees in front of trees that are in front of other trees. And how do you separate them out? Because when you look at them, you have no problem telling which, which trees are passing behind and which are passing in front. Trust yourself that if you can see that clearly, then you can paint it. It's paintable. It's just a series of values and edges that's going to bring some branches and trees back and bring some forward. I, I might go out with a sketchbook and spend at least five to 10 minutes composing before you do the next one and try to take an extreme. Take that thing that you want to be your subject matter and shove it all the way to the side just to see what happens, to see what you can do with the rest of it. Uh, if, are we running out of time here? Yes, we are. I, I look up some of the work of Antonio Mancini, some of his uh, figure work. Um, I've seen him take a portrait and shove the head completely up in the corner and somehow make it look completely normal. With landscape painting, because you're constantly moving things around and editing things out and adding, adding, some, adding some things in, this would uh, uh, give you, by, by doing that sketch ahead of time, you'll take your main subject matter, move it 
out of the center and actually give it more pride of place by giving yourself a chance to move into the composition toward your subject matter and then be able to move around the rest of the painting rather than just coming straight into your subject and getting stuck there. Oh, okay. That's a very interesting way to look at it. Yep. Thanks. I call it the what if game. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. And we have um, coons, uh, which might not be in Oh, it's group, not in there. But I can bring it up when you're ready. All right. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We will not let Coon down today. Excellent. That's all I can say. I'm I'm thrilled with this, Sue. Are you here today? Okay. Um what I like about it is the direction of paint handling. I uh, it it's an obvious obvious conscious effort that certain things are vertical, certain things are horizontal, and certain things are more spontaneous. Uh, an excellent way to work around this kind of subject. If you look at this, this uh, reference photo, most people would not even attempt it. They wouldn't attempt it because there isn't obvious way to organize it. Sue chose a way of handling the paint that organizes it so well that it reads that it reads beautifully. I probably would have spent a little bit more time on these foreground shapes just to get that feeling of dappled sunlight a little better. Other than that, it's a beautiful piece. Thank you, Sue. Yelena, how wonderful to see your work. All right. I'm going to do a real quick levels pull in on this. Just, just to show what this sketch probably actually looks like. Okay, so that's what I think this probably looks like, rather than this. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. So I'm going to take a look at that. Excellent subject matter. It's already divided off very cleanly. Somebody was nice enough to shovel that driveway <laughs> and give you a nice, uh, a simple perspective and dark patch in amongst all of this light foreground. Beautiful, beautiful choice. Now, what I'm seeing in, in your piece here, is this the final or is this how you, or is this how you finished it on that day? Are you here today, Elena? I don't think she's here right now. Okay. Um, I, I am not sure if this is the final piece. I don't see a signature. Uh, I think this is probably as far as she probably got on that day. Um, immediately, the line work sets the areas off, and yet I don't get the feeling that they're chopped out, that, that it's a collage. Already, the brushwork is uniting so many of these. And a consistent handling across everything uh, brings this piece together so nicely. I love the feeling of space back here, the breakup of the center, the wonderful scene here. I don't know if I would have grouped so tightly, I probably would have left uh, something 
a little bit more because right now this feels a little too tightly grouped in the middle of all of this. Uh, but other than that, I really like the, the feeling of the perspective of the atmosphere and the feeling of the perspective of the lines as they were chosen. Thank you, Yelena. And we had Coons and one other person's, correct? I think we lost your audio, Robin. Here I am. We, um, yep. we had Coons. Let's see. I'm going to do something first. Okay. Well, I th may have uh, Coons here because yeah. I think I grabbed it from the. Uh... All right. Okay. And if you don't mind, Coons. Is the one on the left a little closer to what you painted than mm -hmm. the one on the right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one on the one on the right is as it was sent, and the one on the left is when I pulled the levels in. So uh, that was uh, the 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 reason I brought. That. I think you probably painted this pretty close to white. Mm -hmm. uh, you chose a bold subject. Uh, was this a, a very heavy uh, sky like this? A very dark sky? Oh, okay. Uh, when rain falls on things, uh, different materials get very dark. A sidewalk or a street can be a completely different value. And as soon as it gets white, it can get, as soon as it gets wet, it can get very, very dark. I think this structure probably got very dark as it got wet and it has that feeling about it. What I'm, what I'm missing is a little better feeling of the consistency of the edge. As I run around this, I probably would have played a little game uh, as I was painting after I blocked in all of this. I would have I would have just concentrated on how the sky met this form. Where were the sharpest edges? Where were the softest edges? And how were they distributed? Because mm -hmm. some of these soft edges just really don't have quite the explanation for what that is. And I realized that architecture can very often appear to have the same edge going across the whole thing. And we know better as artists that an edge needs variety, but it actually has variety in it if you're squinting down, if you're studying it, especially because these clouds are probably passing by fairly quickly if it's raining. And leaving different edges, giving you choices. Mm -hmm. I think your darks may have gone a little too dark uh, up in here because it's so much up into the light and it's almost the same value as what you've done under the bridge. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had looked up here and compared down underneath the bridge, I think you would have found more of a value difference with that. But I love the composition. Very bold. Thank you, Kuhn. Is that the one, Sharon? Yes, it is. Great. Okay. Like I did a little crooked on there. <laughs> I didn't realize that. The only thing that, that strikes me first is there's a tree out in the daylight that is darker than underneath the bridge. It's a, it's a simple value uh, issue. And the first thing you do when you go out is squint down and point out your darkest dark and lightest light and make sure everything else moves in toward the middle tone from that. So simply... 
simply lightening up the values in the tree would immediately fix that problem. I know exactly what happened. You were looking here and looking at the complexity of all of this and seeing it as dark instead of seeing it as part of the entire scene and then comparing it with things that are actually deep in shadow. Yeah, I think you're okay. right. And how much time? About two hours, I think. Two, yeah, two. Kind of has that feeling. Um, I, I think a little bit uh, understanding of uh, paint handling would make this background much more interesting because right now it's all kind of the same thickness. Yeah, you know what? I threw that on at the end. I'm not happy with the decisions I made up there okay. and I'm for suggestions. It was pretty complex up there, but I didn't want to take it away you know, away, anything away from the subject below it. So I'm looking for some suggestions on a better way to handle that. A better way to handle that would have been to do that first instead of last. If you do that first, then you bring up, you bring up everything to the level that you want. Right now, you've painted this as you, uh, as you think you want, and then how to deal with the rest of this then becomes difficult. I find that painting some of that big mass of subtle stuff is much easier to do when you don't have all of this drawing and sharp edges and high contrast going on in the rest of the painting. So some of that is just simply slapping paint around within the middle tones and looking for a nice color harmony. So just simplify it and bring it to a middle range. It's not quite so colorful. <clears throat> it's not the color that bothers me. I think that the value structure could be, you know, some of these little dark spots and things I uh, brought closer together. Because right now I feel that you had this area on top of the, the bridge and you filled it in. Whereas if you had painted that entire upper part first and then come forward with the painting uh, with the details uh, afterward, I think the background would have held together a little better. But nice composition, very nice composition. I like it a lot. Thank you. And there was one other person you said? Aaron. Uh, okay, there we go. I'm going to quickly pull in these levels. Nope. They don't need it. Just a little tiny touch. Yeah. See, there's a slightly yellow cast to it. And then when I put the levels changes on there, it brightens up a bit and take some of that yellow cast that was on there off. Um, very difficult subject. You look at this mass of, of trees and how do you deal with that? Well, you dealt with it nicely with a variety of connected shapes, which is something that a lot of people can't seem to get. You've connected up some of your lights, you've connected up uh, some of the masses in the trees, and then you've got some interesting paint handling variety of thickness uh, happening. I would, I, I get the feeling that this is painted with the trees in mind. Uh, one of the things that helps a great deal when you get to a certain point is just simply look at all of the sky holes and look at the edges around them. And just work on those. Don't think about trees anymore. Think about the sky holes. And oftentimes, the trees will look better by doing that. Uh, good variety of paint handling. And I think that a little bit more careful study with the edges in the foreground would help. These horizontal brush strokes, I can't tell if this is grass. I think it is. And that edge wouldn't look uh, like that if there was uh, park grass, which isn't, you know, 
usually particularly well maintained. So you would get uh, uh, verticals in there and you would get bare spots. Uh, so a little bit of uh, more careful study with the edges and the direction of brush strokes in the foreground. And I think that would lay down very nicely. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, thank you so much for taking your time. Problem at all, I'm sorry about this dropping out, Mike. Uh, I'm, I've just put all this stuff together in the last two days and this is the first time I'm trying it out. <laughs> I really need to practice and I didn't have a chance to, I'm sorry. We thank you. Great for, job, so Clayton, for keeping up with the dropouts. <laughs> uh, no need to apologize. We understand. This was yeah, excellent. Thank so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I hope it was an enjoyable experience anyway. <laughs> it was wonderful yeah. talking with all of you. I and uh, again, I'm thrilled to to. I'm thrilled to talk to somebody. I got to get it out before it drops out again. Uh, and I hope you're all staying safe and uh, taking care of yourselves. And maybe I'll see you this summer at the Pal. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Thank Clayton. You very much. Thank you bye -bye. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.